Anyway, so we're going to be in Leviticus 19, and um, I'm glad he just put chapter 19 on there because um, I intended to do the whole chapter, but after this morning and going back over everything, I don't think I'll make it. So uh, there's just a lot there, and we're going to go ahead and let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for your word given to us, and the account of the Old Testament and just how it ties into uh, into, uh, our our day and age, Lord, that we live in, knowing that you're a God that does not change, but you meet your people where they're at, and that is just a mind blower. And uh, because you're holy and and perfect, and, and yet just like the worship song that we that we sang that you're, we're so grateful because you're faithful. And also, Lord, that, that you didn't wait for us. You came and you left heaven. You came in frail humanity to rescue us. And we want to thank you for that. And so as we study your word, we just ask that you would uh, speak to us, Lord, and that we would have that hearing ear. So I pray for all those that are here and Lord, the distractions of the day or the week or the month or the relationship or whatever may be uh, there, I pray that, that, Lord, they would just set that on the back burner and just hear from you. And so we know that you are faithful to speak through your word. And so we lift up this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you've seen there, I did entitle the message, Swimming Against the Current. And so the idea is to swim against the current of this world's system. Because if we don't, it can certainly be exhausting. If we attempt to do things in our own strength, it will certainly be exhausting. And we will uh, wear out and eventually get drawn with the current if we're not following the Lord and when we say we get to that place where we say, you know, I'm just tired. I think I'm just going to stop and rest for a little bit. And that's when it happens that you get caught off guard and you begin to lose ground. And what happens is, is then you end up going in the wrong direction altogether when that happens. It's called drifting. And we're not to to drift, but we're to walk by faith. In Galatians 6, 9, Paul writing, he says, don't grow weary in well-doing. And that's our tendency, is when we're doing well for the Lord to suddenly lean to our own strength and we grow weary. And the idea is, is that weariness will grow on you if you're doing things in your own strength. It'll affect the way that you're thinking, It'll affect your lifestyle. It'll affect the patterns in your life that are set if we go that direction and lean to our own strength. But God has called his people to holiness. And, you know, we see that just in the first or the second verse there. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so he's calling his people to be holy, no longer conforming to the world. As Paul wrote, remember in Romans uh, 12, 2, where he says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect work of God and so you know and so the idea is the same in the New Testament not being conformed to the world you know not to warm up to its ways and those ways that are opposed to God's ways and to drift with uh, you know it's persuasive current because it can be very persuasive as we look around we begin to desire the things that we see if we're not careful because they're attractive 
And you know, sin, the Bible says, is pleasurable for a season. But then comes judgment. And so we always have to be looking in the light of what God is directing us in. Be determined to follow God's way as you learn and as it is being shown to you. Don't fashion yourself after the pattern of the world. Don't lean to those things. That's what it means not to be conformed. And, you know, it's the way of to compromise. And what's so great is uh, the Lord is patient as we learn and as we, you know, studying in this book of Leviticus, we, that's exactly what we'll see that's part of the nature of God, the character of God, and he doesn't change. And so that's why it's comforting to see how he would minister to his people. So they were being called out of bondage. Now, see, the thing is, is that's what they wanted. They wanted to be called out of bondage. But you know what that required? That required an intervention of God, that they would be delivered. Just like today when we call out to Jesus Christ. We cannot deliver ourselves. It requires an intervention of God. And so God intervened. And so for those of us that cry out to the Lord, we can be saved because he intervened for us. And now with our newborn freedom and life, we are called out of an old life and the old way of thinking into a new life in Christ. And then we begin to go against the current but not in our own strength. Hopefully we know that. I said that like three times already, right? Not in our own strength. But God empowers us when we trust and obey him. Then comes the victory, his victory in us and through us. Not our own victory apart from him. And so remember, it's the Lord who never tires. It's the Lord who never leaves us. You know, it's the Lord who never lacks, you know, the strength and never gives up. And so, and so here, as we read, the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, keep in mind and remember that this book of Leviticus was given to God's people in a a 30-day time frame. And it was going to become a document, a written document, the Old Testament. And it is written for the protection of God's people. Because that's what the word of God does. It protects us. Psalms 119.9, how does a young man cleanse his way? But giving heed to the word of God. And so there's that protectiveness also in Ephesians 6, 17. It tells us that it is the sword of the spirit. Why? Well, because 24, 7, there's a spiritual battle that's raging around us that we need to be engaged in. And so it becomes the sword of the spirit in the sense that it's his command. It's his promises. It's the insights of wisdom and knowledge and understanding What do they do? They safeguard us, gives right counsel and direction that comes from the word of God. And this is exactly why the Lord spoke to Moses because a directive was going to be given to his people to protect them. Even though they might not totally understand what it all meant, but yet he was giving them their word and, and they were to be set apart. That's what... The word holy means, it's interesting, because this particular verse 2 is a theme verse of the entire book of Leviticus. And what it means to be holy then is the same thing it means to be holy now. The word itself means saint, and it is to be separate, sanctified for the Lord, and it were to be saints, not saint in like Catholic way of thinking, because, you know, in the Catholic way of thinking that somebody does great things and then they, they usually die and then they're made saints later on and then everybody look to them for whatever, like, you know, Saint, saint Anthony. You know, I'm, of course I was raised Catholic because I'm Italian. That just goes together. And, uh, and so, you know, 
Saint, Saint Anthony was the patron saint of things that were lost or lost people. And so you would pray to Saint Anthony if you believed that way. I lost my whatever. And you'd pray to him and he would help you. And if there's some, if there's people that were lost, you'd pray to Saint Anthony for help. You know, Saint uh, Christopher. Saint Christopher was patron saint of I think travelers or something like that. And, uh, and so you would, you, would, and you would pray to him for, I think, uh, safety and protection or something. I can't remember. But that's not what it means to be a saint according to the word of God. And, and especially when you see who is this written to. And it says there, to all the congregation. Speak to all the congregation. And so, and then this also, this word is, is uh, repeated to us in the New Testament. The connection is when Peter's writing in chapter 1, verse 15 and, and 16, and uh, he says there, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And see how that transfers over into the New Testament. And, um, and so in, in our holiness, in our, our separateness, in our sold outness to the Lord, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. And so uh, being holy involves actions and, of course, attitudes toward God and, and man. And you see here, there's to be order in the home. And it's interesting concerning the Sabbath because although the Sabbath wasn't given as a command to the church in the New Testament because Jesus is our Sabbath rest, but the principle of the Sabbath still stands where one doesn't say, I'm going to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day to get more money. You know, the idea is that you'll set time aside, whether it be a uh, Saturday, which is the Sabbath, or, or whether it be a Sunday. The first church began to meet on a Sunday. And yet every other one of the commandments, the other nine were given, commanded to the church. And yet the freedom we have in the Sabbath is pick the day, but set it aside. The principle still stands. And so be holy, be set apart for the Lord. And you can't do whatever you want to do to be holy. You cannot do... Uh, you, you know, you do what God commands us to do, and that is being holy, be a set apart. Do not turn to idols, which of course is what usually happens when a person's not sold out or holy, turns to idols. Don't, it says, do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. And so anything put in place of God, a God substitute, is an idol. God says, no, be holy. Do not put anything to substitute for me. And if you offer a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it and on the next, uh, and on the next day. And if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned the, the hallowed offering of the Lord and that person shall be cut off from his people. Now, that echoes what we studied in Leviticus chapter 3. This is the peace offering or the fellowship offering and is the offering that was to be shared uh, kind of like a big barbecue. And so, uh, and so it was, it was uh, when they would come and confess and, and make a sacrifice, they would share it not only with the priests, but all their neighbors and friends, and they would have a barbecue. And so, you know, that's considered the fellowship offering. And you notice what God says first, that it needs to be of your own free will. And any acceptable sacrifice to the Lord is of your own free will. In other words, he gives us a choice. And this, so this is a free will and fellowship and peace offering and so forth. And, 
And then he says that, you know, you shall eat, eat the same day and the next day, but not the third day. So I'll pay attention to detail. And for sure, for one, the practical elements there is that um, by the third day, no refrigeration, hot, whatever, you're going to begin to have bacteria building up and, and everything else. And so by eating it, you can get very sick, you know, to say the least. And so, and, and it would be, to eat it the third day, the Lord says, an abomination. And so, you know, and it would literally be an abomination. I know if you took that, that uh, and looked under a microscope, and you saw the activities of that third day sitting out in warm conditions. You think, that's an abomination. You know, I don't want to eat that. You get a close-up look at what God might be talking about. I know when I was in China, and we got off the beaten path because we missed a flight, and we were down by the Vietnam border. And so we went into a, a restaurant that wasn't on the restaurant, you know, plan. And so we didn't really know what was going to happen. We just know it was dark and it was kind of strange and it was curtains hanging everywhere. We were sitting there. And we didn't even order. They started bringing out food. It's like, okay, this is different. Anywhere on the beaten path, you know, they had, you could order. And so they started bringing it all out and putting it all out. And everybody's just sort of looking at each other. It was nine on our party. And, um, and so uh, I remember my prayer is, Lord, I know if there's any bacteria here, it's as big as elephants to you. So... Slay the elephants, you know, and, uh, and, then we, and then we ate. And then I know that the gals were the smart ones. They ate only white rice and, uh, or, or, you know, how it worked out. I didn't get sick when I was there. But um, anyway, uh, the only thing I recognized was uh, the white rice and then chicken. And the chicken, when we lifted the big silver platter, was a whole chicken with head and everything on it. It looked like it was with his tongue hanging out, hanging off the... And... Uh, my friend, who was on the same page as me, he broke the top of the cone off and then started eating, so it was interesting. But, you know, the Lord, he has these uh, principles in place for our protection. And, and when you look at this as being uh, the fellowship offering, I think that a good spiritual connection there would be is not having leftovers in fellowship. And obviously, in the Bible, we're directed and encouraged daily to have fellowship with the Lord. You know, as the Lord's Prayer would say, you know, give us this day our daily bread. And then, you know, and then also um, the Bible tells us to pick up our cross daily and follow the Lord. And so that speaks of a daily devotion life. But, you know, if we just sort of neglect that, that's not good. When you start thinking in terms of what it says at the end, that person who goes there profanes the hollow offering, that person shall be cut off. And when you think about the importance of getting into the word, you remember the, remember the account of manna? They could collect manna, but it had to be daily. They couldn't save it till the next day even. But on the day before the, the Sabbath day, they get two days worth. But they weren't going to eat that second day's worth on the third because it turns into an abomination, a bowl full of worms. It's the same principle. Daily they were to eat of the word, the bread of life. And so when you look at the end result of those who would defame God's, you know, hollowed uh, offering there, they shall be cut off. Well, think about that in terms of a, a believer who would be cut off in fellowship. Not that the Lord would forsake them, but now all of a sudden in the way that they're viewing things. And I have seen this over and over when a person gets out of fellowship with the Lord and then they suddenly come to church, all of a sudden everybody's against them. They can't understand how come they don't fit in. They feel isolated. And they're not getting enough attention. And it becomes all about them. Those who are fellowshipping with the Lord daily, they come in here, they have a servant's heart. If somebody blows them off, they're thinking, oh, I'm going to pray for them. They're not thinking selfishly. They're thinking as a servant, or how can I minister to them? Or maybe you did, I did do something wrong. Let me go find out. It's not about them. They're not cut off. They're not isolated. They don't feel isolated. No, they're in the Lord. They're confident. I started thinking about all of that and the idea of just blowing off the whole fellowship offering thing. 
the peace offering before the Lord. And so in verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you shall not glean your vineyards, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And so here, notice that those who reap the harvest, there's that work that's going on, and with their possessions, others are in mind. So the first thing you do is when you're collecting your possessions, you have in mind those who are needy, and then they're instructed, don't take from the corners, don't take from those designated areas, but leave that for the poor. And when you consider that there, that the poor are being considered those less fortunate, but notice they had to work. They weren't just going to be given handouts. They had to work. This was left for you. Now go out and work and get it. You know, there's, there's no better way than messing someone's life up to just keep giving them free handouts and they never have to work for it. I'm not talking about someone who's physically incapable of working. I'm talking about all those that just like the hand, handouts. They just keep getting everything handed to them on a golden platter, but they don't work for it anymore. And the New Testament's clear. You don't work, you don't eat. It sure lines up with this passage given in here. And it's destructive to even our own society. I mean, what's wrong with saying, okay, you're going to be on food stamps or you're going to be getting this, you know, perk, or you're going to be getting this because of whatever reason they qualify. But guess what? The highways need to be cleared up. So here's an orange vest. Go pick up cans because we're going to be paying you. So go work for it. But no, we don't want to do that for whatever reason. But you know what? That would be a good thing. And I'll tell you what, a lot of work could get done, you know. And so, and so, um, that's the principle given here for them who are poor and for the stranger. And of course, Jesus said to us, you'll always have the poor among you. And so because we always have the poor among you, there should also be that sensitivity, uh, even if we're not farmers. However it is that the Lord would bless us and we would bless others. Look for those that are less fortunate. And so uh, verse 11 you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And so, you know, of course, stealing is not something that, that we're to do. But the less obvious look at that in relationship to the verse before would be stealing just by keeping everything as being yours. You know, this is all mine. I don't need to share. Well, that's stealing according to God's way because we are to share. You know, we are to give. We are to look at the needy and those that need help and so forth. And so, of course, that's the context there from verse 10 and the importance of our words. What identifies us? You know, James tells us that salt water and fresh water doesn't come from the same source. You know, I think it's, it does fig trees give olives or, you know, and it gives, gives it a, another example there. Grapevines, do they give figs? Now, the idea is, is that, you know, what's your MO? What identifies you? What defines you? And so there shouldn't be a contradiction in the words and the things you do to who you are. Because you know what? If you're set apart in holiness, you're going to represent the Lord. And when you don't, you're just going to come clean and, you know, start over. Because God's a God of new beginnings. And so you, uh, verse 13, shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him is, who is hired not remain with you all night until morning. 
I think that's interesting because when people would go to do a day's work, it's not like they had bank accounts or they had pantries full of food or whatever. They'd get paid and go out and buy a loaf of bread, something to eat to provide for their family. So like today, you know, you don't get paid for a week or you don't get paid for two weeks. Or you don't get paid for a month. What good is that going to do those people that are living from hand to mouth or from day to day? And so that causes all kinds of problems in their life. And so, no, they were to pay out daily so that they can just, you know, be provided for. You shall not curse the deaf nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. And one thing is for sure, I always said, I would not want to be a judge at all. And this here is speaking about, you know, those who, uh, again, general treatment of those who are, are vulnerable or dependent upon you or those that you might have the upper hand with. And I like our system that we have in America because, you know, it's thinking of the deaf and the blind and those that are confined to wheelchairs and all of that. I like that. I like that. I know that stood out to me when I was visiting my daughter down in Dana Point there in Southern California in the beach community. And we were walking and we were at, I think it was any one of those streets, but I remember Golden Lantern and Pacific Coast Highway. And you push the little button to cross and right there by the button, there's the braille. For those that are blind can feel right where they're at. And as soon as you push the button, it goes, golden lamp, you're a golden lantern in Pacific Coast Highway. Beep, beep, beep. And it starts beeping. So apparently from that braille, they'll know, okay, 20 beeps, you better be across or whatever. And then they could head out. And then for us who can see, well, then the numbers are there. And then they've got the little ramps for the wheelchairs and they got all this. I think that's a great thing. You know, because I know if I was deaf and blind or confined to a wheelchair, I think that, that I would sure be blessed to have all that. Where, you know, those of us who are healthy and strong maybe don't think about it too much. Well, the same goes for those of you who are taken care of by the Lord and so blessed and whatever. You've got to think of those that are less fortunate because they're going to respond in the same way that a blind person would respond when they're feeling that braille on that pole ready to cross and hearing that thing and hearing that somebody's thought about me. You know, this is a blessing, and in their blind state, they go, man, I'm really blessed and really thankful that somebody's thinking of me, that this is going on. And that's not in every part of the world. That stuff goes on. And so, you know, this really, I think, represents the heart of the Lord in that. And so, you know, also, you're to, to do, uh, you shall do no injustice in judgment. I thought of that old series back on TV with Dragnet. For those of you old-timers, Dragnet, Sergeant Friday. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. And then, you know, I, I always thought that was interesting because, you know, he started asking questions and then, and it's always ma'am. It was never a guy, just the facts, sir. It was always a ma'am that I remember, right? And, oh, and I, you know what I think happened? Just the facts, ma'am. I don't want, I don't want to get caught up in circumstantial, you know, sort of ideas and so forth. And... You know, I wouldn't make a good judge because I know just being a man, well, what if the facts are distorted in one way or another? That could mess up my judgment. I wouldn't like that. I always said, you know, just like an official on, on the soccer field. I was an official on a soccer field, and I didn't like it because you know what? When one team was destroying the next team, and it was like 10 nothing, I wanted to start calling it better for the team that was losing. Well, that's not right. And say, well, you know what? They, they deserve that. So, yeah, I'm going to call it that way. Or, you know, no. God says, no. It doesn't matter if they're poor or rich. There is no distinction. And so what you have to understand about the care of, character of God when it comes to judgment and salvation, it doesn't matter if a person's poor. It doesn't matter if a person's rich. There's going to be justice and judgment. Because God is righteous, and he will always call it right. And so, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. And so, of course, a talebearer is an instigator, 
somebody who carries tales and the ideas, tall stories, with the, the motivation to slander. Terrible person. Say, don't do that. You know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Tell the truth. Tell, tell what's true. And don't go around bringing false accusations and claims and so forth. And the context regarding the neighbor would be that. Don't bring false claims and come against your neighbor. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so basically, you're not to have hatred in your heart toward your brother. And, you know, number one, the heart is interesting because the Bible says only God knows the heart. You know, he's the one that knows. But you can know whether you have hatred in your heart. You're just not going to know all the little secret areas of your heart like God would. But, you know, and it tells us in um, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So there's a connection and a challenge to be right in your heart. And then also, I know that uh, hatred and love are not going to coexist in your heart. And it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, 9 and 10, it says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And so again, so you can't hate your brother and then say that, you know, you're holy, that you're set apart for the Lord because the two can't coexist. And then it says, you shall not take ven vengeance. And so the idea is, is that you shall surely rebuke your neighbor. And that's the idea, you know, there of not letting something uh, to fester, but you deal with it. So it's a good thing. And some people are, that's kind of their, their strength, but others, they want to avoid all, you know, kind of confrontation. Uh, and yet that ends up being the wrong thing to do. Because and then things fester, and when things fester, a root of bitterness can develop there and get embedded in their heart. And that's never good. That, and because then you see what happens is you become a co-conspirator or the end there, not to bear sin because of him. And so because of your silence, because you're you know, willing to ignore the obvious, you become an accomplice. And now because you're not dealing with it, that backfires on you. When all you have to do is be honest and speak the truth, what they did with it is up to them. But you, you speak the truth in love. And that's what the counsel of God is. Or, or else you have a tendency would, would be to take vengeance yourself. Well, regarding whatever it is that's going on, vengeance is, it says, take no, uh, shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge. Because if you bear that grudge, that root of bitterness, you know, uh, will get entrenched in, in your heart. And it says in uh, Hebrews 12, verse 15, where it says, looking caref carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And so it's the idea of something going around, something going on underground, out of sight. And if it, it could happen to anyone if you come short of the grace. And so you don't have the attitude like, except be for God's grace, there go I. I'm not deserving of all that I understand or know. 
And what I understand or know God's given me, so I'm responsible then to pass on that grace that God's extended to me, to others, lest I get a root of bitterness that springs up. In other words, it starts off as a root, then it springs up, meaning it grows, and now it surfaces into something and not good. Not speaking about good fruit, speaking about bad fruit that would grow up and then cause trouble. And so it's the idea of, you know, this trouble, like something disturbing takes place and many become defiled or messed up. And it speaks to their defiled means to die with another color, to discolor, which be, would be Christ's love, to discolor grace. It's disturbing what comes from that sort of behavior is the idea. Don't go there. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't bear a grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so what's interesting is we know that Jesus uh, answering a lawyer, a scribe, what the two greatest commandments are, and that was to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law hung on these two commandments. And it's interesting when you think about that, because and then right following his comments regarding that, he, gives, he answers her question because the one wanted to, you know, think of himself as being righteous. Well, who is my neighbor anyway? And then he gives the parable of the good Samaritan. And in that parable, the neighbor was somebody he found on the roadside that was hurt and needed help. The total stranger. And so what God, what God did, and when you think about uh, what a neighbor means, it means a fellow creature is what it means. But of course, in the whole political, pious world, they changed it to, to be more refined than that. But God never said that the person he puts in your path isn't your neighbor to love and to take care of as God would see fit. That's the proper definition of a neighbor. And so, besides including the one next door, <laughs> you know? But, and so, you know, you're to love your neighbor uh, as yourself, I am the Lord. And so, he gives that command. And then, um, just want to cover this last verse. You shall keep my statutes. Now, so remember, God's directing his people, a very superstitious people who had learned their behaviors watching a pagan society that he delivered them from. Keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind you shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. And so that's interesting, but only to discover that the practice of the cultic pagan nations that they observed would do this, believing that there was some magical benefits and perks before all their gods that they would do this. And that was the reasons that they would do this. And God says, no, you're not going to follow their ways. You're going to follow my statutes. So he's trying to break that mindset. Is thinking that that's why good things would happen because I breed this cow with this other kind of cow and that's why the gods are shining down on me. And that's the kind of things that they believed. And quoting Guzik, he writes, the mixing of these things, these different species of livestock, seeds, and fabrics was usually seen by the pagans to be a source of magical powers. God wanted Israel to have no association with these pagan customs, unquote. And so when we look back, remember at the last chapter, verse 3, there was not to be any blurring of the lines. You know, where God had said, according to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, you shall not do. And then also to going into the land of Canaan, you shall not do what you see there. You're going to follow my statutes. So there's no blurring of the lines. Otherwise, confusion would result. And, you know, who lurks in the shadows? The devil. You know, it says God's not the author of confusion, but he's the author of peace. 
And that's the peace we get by following the Lord. And so you're not to mix these different things. And when I thought about mixed linen, also, I thought about, um, you know, the same thing. The mixing of the different threads, somehow or another, was a magical benefit, like wearing, a, you know, holy underwear or something. <laughs> I don't know. But some sort of benefits of the garments that, you know, you would, you would wear. And so when I thought about that, there was, I'm going to make one, one connection here really quick. And because there was these idolatrous practices, and I want to quote Whitlaw here. I thought this was great. Of the ancient Zabians, or fire worshippers, who sow different seeds accompanying the fact with magical rites and invocations. And commentators have generally thought to des- uh, thought the design of this and the proceeding law was to put an end to unnatural lust and foolish superstitions which were prevalent among the heathen. But the reason of the prohibition was probably deeper. For those who have studied the diseases of land and vegetables tell us that the practice, is, the practice of mingling seeds is injurious both to flowers and grains. If the various gen- genera of the natural order of the grumani, which includes the grains and grasses, should be shown in the, sown in the same field and flowers at the same time so that the pollen of the two flowers mix, a spurious seed will be the consequence called by farmers chess. It is always inferior and unlike either of the two grains that produce it in size and flavor and nutrients, princi- nutrients principles, I, I independently contributing to the disease of the soil, they never fail to produce the same in animals and men that feed them. And so, unquote. But in layman's terms, it means poor quality, disease laden, and compounding effects. That's the practical element of those things. Now, of course, the naturalist or the, the, you know, the, the nutritionist will tell us that our system is whacked out. They're probably right. And we're not getting near the nutrients that we should get. And that the system is diseased and watered down and then they recommend the supplements that we need. And they recommended the food that's grown a certain way and all those things. But the point, last point, and I I mention all of this because this is a reminder that we don't need to be scientists, that we don't need to be biologists, that we don't need to be chemists nutritionist, mathematicians, any of these things, we don't need to understand completely what it is that God is showing us. We need to believe. We need to have faith. And then if he decides to reveal it or you come across the information, cool, great. But otherwise, trust him because God is faithful be predetermined to follow him in his word and according to the new testament gospel of grace and then these characteristics and nature of god that's paid forward to us to understand how grace works that god is long suffering you know the lord he's teaching us and he never expects us to learn something overnight just like with his people but you know what he does expect forward motion even if it's gradual and slow forward motion because God is so gracious and so faithful that's the nature of God because God is the good shepherd of our soul and he takes care of us you know and so for those things that we don't understand wait for it because guess what he may choose at some other point to show us all that he's done I know that in my life there was times when I would step in faith and I would just think like, I don't understand this. And then just by obeying and following the command of the Lord, later he shows me exactly what he was doing and I'm blown away by it. And so what I've learned over the, over the years is, okay, 
Even if I don't understand the situation, I know God's word is instructing me to be just like this. And guess what? You will be blessed if you follow that. And there's a whole lot more in that chapter, but I knew I wouldn't get to it. So let's go ahead and stand. And so the baptism starts at 2, Tumalo Creek Park, Tumalo State Park. And if you don't know where that's at, come and see me. And um, so I hope to see you there. We'll have barbecue, and it'll just be, um, it'll be just a, a real neat time together. All right? And let's... What's that? Uh, is it... Did I say 1 o'clock? Oh, 1 o'clock. Okay. I'd have been late. Well, I was just testing you. Just testing you. Okay, 1 o'clock, sorry. Father, thank you for uh, today. Lord, we thank you that, uh, you know, even as we feel the sanctuary warming up, that's only a good sign. Lord, we're praying for a warm Sunday, and so we want to thank you for that. We just ask, Lord, that uh, you would bless our fellowship time, and I pray for all those here, Lord, that are, you know, just uh, looking to you right now. I just pray for that reinforcement of their faith, and that they would follow you, Lord. And if any are being overwhelmed by life circumstances, I pray that for their deliverance as they trust in you and they, and they just recognize, Lord, that it has to be from you and so that you would continue to bless and, and move. And we thank you for all that you're going to do today and you've already done. And so we just trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.